Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Sustainable House Day expert session. Uh, we're so glad you could join us tonight. First, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the stolen lands of many First Nations peoples. I am speaking to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We would like to acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. If you'd like, feel free to share which Ab Aboriginal land you're joining us from in the chat. Before the webinar begins, I would like to tell you a little bit about Sustainable House Day and Renew. So Sustainable House Day is a national event that gives you access to Australia's most sustainable homes. This year, we're offering four themed weeks of online and in-person events around the country leading up to Sustainable House Day, which is this Sunday, uh, October 17th, when we will host a day of free online sessions with homeowners. This week our, is our, uh, is our Climate Resilient Homes Week. Uh, and you can see our website for other uh, events that we have this week. You can visit sustainablehousey.com to see detailed house profiles and tour videos for the 130 homes open this year and to book for our upcoming events. Sustainable House Day is organized by Renew, a not-for-profit that inspires, enables, and advocates for people to live sustainably in their homes and communities. You can find out more about us at renew.org.au. Tonight's session will begin with expert presentations and presentations by some of our Sustainable House Day homeowners, and then move on to a Q&A session. You can ask questions at any point in the webinar this evening using Zoom's Q&A function, which you can find in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Please use the Q&A and not the chat to ask questions. We also have live closed captioning for this event. To use it, you can click on live custom live streaming service in the upper left-hand corner of your Zoom window, and then click view stream to see the automated captioning in a browser window. Uh, so that's it for me. Now I would like to hand over to our MC for this meeting and a member of the Renew board, Michael O'Connell. Thank you, Sophie. Um, welcome, everybody, um, to this what promises to be a really, really interesting um, w webinar this evening. Um, we've got a number of uh, really brilliant presenters today, all talking about water. For those people who don't know me, my name is Mike O'Connell. I've been a long-standing uh, member of the uh, of Renew and formerly ATA, of course. Uh, currently on the committee, as, uh, as Sophie just said, um, but I've also got a very strong focus on sustainability. I've got a permaculture garden. Um, do a lot of work of, of I've got some interest in water since I have a 25,000 litre tank out in the backyard um, that we use um, but more importantly than me are the presenters this evening um, we've got three presenters and then a fourth person who we're lucky enough to have with us for the Q&A session as the panellists uh, later on um, the first person we're going to have up is um, uh, Dennis Doon um, he's going to be talking about um, all things water related um, water diverters and, and a whole range of interesting topics the second speaker will be uh, Margaret uh, Mostakowski, Mostakowska, sorry, um, and she's from the Moss House Edible Garden in New South Wales, um, located on a steep hill. Moss House Garden is an example of a 13-year-old vibrant sustainable permaculture property designed with primary goal to provide owners with food, medicine and fibre plants. And she's from, she uh, she's going to give us a, a very interesting talk indeed. Roman Spur from Spurtopia. Um, is aiming to be self-sufficient, as we all are, and well, many of us are, uh, energy, food, water, and waste-free uh, to showcase the home for people to come and be inspired. So uh, applying a clever design, uh, the ideas, inventions, engineering, using readily available materials, uh, and they make the place an outstanding with continuous improvement. So they passionately like to share practical and inexpensive ideas for sustainable living. Uh, and there'll be links available um, afterwards for that. Um, and then uh, finally, we have uh, Eric Brocken, who's from the Hawkesbury Earth Care Centre in New South Wales, um, who's uh, it's another um, Renew uh, facility that we have out there at the university. Um, and Eric's been involved in that for, for many years. Um, the Earthcare building itself util utilises passive solar design and a variety of building materials and techniques to demonstrate sustainability options in domestic and commercial construction, uh, walls of rammed earth, mud brick and straw bale. Um, so 
as you can see, we've got a, a, an amazing, um, amazing number of people. Each presentation will go for roughly 20 minutes. Um, once we have all the presentations, we'll open up to the panel uh, and then we'll actually field some of your questions. And so the questions can be coming in and they'll be curated and we'll see if we can get through as many questions as we can. So first up, I'll give uh, another little brief um, introduction to Margaret um, to um, help her get ready and make sure she's uh, ready to go. So Margaret's from um, Moss House Edible Garden, um, and it's an example of a 13-year-old sustainable permaculture property um, designed with a private primary goal to give the, provide the owners with food, medicine and fibre plants. Based on that, and she's promised us a very, very interesting um, presentation. So, Margaret, uh, it's over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, am I on? Yes, I am. So, uh, I would like to welcome you from Wolumata Gun Land, which is in Sydney between Parramatta and Lake of River. And I'm going to talk about the sustainability in terms of water usage. And I know that with sustainability, everyone talks about having solar panels, uh, water tanks, which I both have, um, and using various uh, devices to limit your home water use and energy use. So this is what we understand as sustainability, but there is more to it and not many people are aware of that. So I'm just going to talk to you about uh, other aspects of living sustainably and let me share me Share my screen. Okay, just moving to, all right. So I'm going to talk about growing food to save water and basically saving water using our gardens. And the reason for that is that growing and sourcing food, it's up to our, uh, up to 60% of our eco print. So it's not really, the energy and the water we save on our in our homes, which is pretty easy to calculate because we can we pay bills for the energy and for water and for gas, you know, for electricity, which we are using in our households. But we don't see the real cost of food. And that is actually the biggest issue and the biggest contributor to our eco print. Um, so this energy and the water used to grow food is basically embedded into everything we eat. So when it comes to energy, people are usually familiar with the concept of food miles, which is uh, how far your food comes. So the cost of transport, the usage of oil and other forms of energy to transport it. But it really starts with farming because to make synthetic fertilizers, which is you know the main food producing industry, and to make farming machinery, a lot of energy is used. Oil and oil byproducts are used as well. Powering farming machinery, powering transport, and also powering cold storage facilities. That includes supermarkets, not just big warehouses. And also the cost of producing packaging for food. That's an enormous cost. And this is something we really cannot avoid because we have to eat. You know, we can live in a tent and use drinking water from a stream, but we have to eat. So this is really important that you understand that the real cost of our sustainability, it's related to food. So let me talk about water. So food production, that's the biggest contributor to total household water usage. So it does not matter if you've got rainwater tanks or you know water divert, di diverters filtering and reuse gray water because each person in Australia needs 10,000 liters of water to grow food they eat in one day. That's 3,650,000 liters of water in a year per person. There is no way a rainwater tank could save you this amount of water. Plus about one fourth of all water used to growing food worldwide. It's to grow a 1 billion ton of food that nobody eats, it's the waste. And it could be wasted in households, but there is also a lot of waste, um, which is related to the farmers being contracted by bigger companies, supermarkets and so on, which require certain size and color of the fruit and veggies supplied. And whatever is too small or you know, non-standard gets destroyed. So we actually lose quarter of uh, water 
which is used to grow food um, because it gets wasted. So again, the numbers, 10,000 liters of water are used to grow food. Each of us eats in one day. It's a little bit more for people who eat meat. It's a little bit less for people who are vegetarian. So that's pretty shocking. Now you can see the cost of common foodstuffs in terms of water. So per one kilogram, or you know, in cottage, uh, 250 gram milk is just one glass. You see how much water is used. And remember, when uh, we talk about meat and you know other animal products like milk and cheese, uh, we also include the water which is used to grow food for the animals. So it's not just uh, the water the animals drink, it's also the water which is needed to grow all the fodder for various you know, sheep, uh, cows, and so on. So you can see it's huge amount of water and it all adds up to about um, 10,000 liters a day. Beef, one kilogram of beef. Okay, nobody would probably eat one kilogram of beef, but one kilogram of beef, that's uh, 15 tons of water. So it's really huge amount. So what to do? Because food production is the biggest contributor to our total water usage, growing food on site in our gardens, it's the best way to save water, not rainwater tanks. And uh, so I will talk about growing food. I will talk uh, how to prepare garden soil to store water and to use water saving garden tricks. But uh, even for people who are not willing to grow food or you know you don't have time or your garden hasn't got enough sun, you can still use your garden to filter the water so it actually returns to the ground and replenishes groundwater. So the water from your garden actually does not go into stormwater drains. So water-wise garden design. So this is really smart way of saving and conserving and recycling water. And uh, such type of water uses less, less uh, sorry, such type of garden uses less water and also conserves the water you use on it. And you can also use your garden to recycle water. So let me talk about reduced water usage, conserving water and recycling water. And you can see that's the surface of a little garden pond I have. And it's covered by a native floating fern, which is actually tiny. This is about two centimeters plant. And it protects the water from evaporating from the surface of the pond. So, you know, one of the ways of protecting water. So reducing water usage. If you have a good design, like uh, where do you have your plants? Is it in a sunny area which needs more water or shade? Um, you have to know how the rainwater flows through your garden. My garden is on a slope and the difference between the street level and uh, the back fence is 11 meters. So it is pretty steep. So the water flows down, but not until I've got like 25 centimeters of uh, rainfall in one day, um, I really don't get much flow of water from the garden into the storm drain. You have to be aware what uh, is the wind direction because wind can dry plants and also frost traps because cold air tends to flow down the slope and sort of pool in uh, sunken areas. So you need to know your garden to work out how to reduce water usage in your garden. You have to plant appropriately so you don't waste water. So you try to put plants which require more watering together and plants which uh, can deal with uh, some dry weather in a separate spot. Don't mix them because that won't be good for the plants because they will get either not enough or too much water. And the proper watering in, on your garden also reduces water usage. So I use mostly rainwater tanks to water my garden and I have 10,000 liter water tank which is connected to the house. So I use it in the laundry and in both toilets, but I also have freestanding rainwater tanks about uh, 3000 liters, which I use to water the garden. So only when it gets really dry, I start using my major rainwater tanks because you know the smaller ones can run out much faster. So proper watering of your garden depends on the time, how often and how you water. So it's best to water in the morning or in the afternoon. Um, it's better to water not too frequently, but pretty deep. 
and watering methods, I know that we all love to walk through the garden with the hose. It's very cathartic, you know, watering the plants, but it does not work very well. Better watering methods is uh, either using a drip system or uh, um, using uh, perforated ag pipes and using uh, self-watering garden beds or wicking beds. So deep watering, not too often. Now, how to conserve water which already falls on your garden as a rain or snow re regarding where you are? And of, of course, if you use city water, you also want to conserve it. So you want the water to go a long way. So important thing to increase water holding capacity of the soil. The best way to store water, it's in the soil. It's not in rainwater tanks. When it comes to water, and I grow a lot of my food in my garden, um, you know, if you have uh, water in the soil, it will feed your plants and also it will percolate down and replenish groundwater. You need to limit evaporation in your garden. So your, your ground, your soil has to be always covered. So you may have various mulches, like woody mulch or sort of straw, hay mulches. You may have living mulches in terms of uh, plants, plant cover. Nasturtiums are great for that, for example. If you have drying winds, and because my garden is on a hill, I face really drying uh, southwesterly and southerly winds. So you have to create some sort of wind breaks so the water you use on your plant does not evaporate too fast. And it could be wind breaks uh, by using fences or by using hedges or various plants. I usually have trees as uh, um, protection from the winds. And in your water, you can also create structures to hold surplus water, which sort of flows on the surface and your ground is so soaked, the water is not really getting into it. So you can create trenches and pits and rain gardens so you store the water in the soil for longer. Now, how to build absorbent soils? I've got clay soil. It's a brick quality clay. There is actually a place of old brickworks two kilometers from me. So what I did, I basically broke the soil with fork. I added some gypsum, some sand, and a little bit of vermiculite, and that opened the soil um, so it absorbs water. If you have sandy soil, you may use additional clay, and compost is always good to add either to clay or to sandy soil because it will hold water. Organic mulches, animal manures, compost on surface of the soil, earthworms and plant roots will actually work on uh, pu pulling this material into deeper layers of the soil. And planting green manures, you can see this is perennial green manure, which is comfrey. I just chop and drop it around my fruit trees. And this is annual green manure, which I use to cover fallow pieces of the ground in the time when I don't grow my food. So mostly, you know, sort of in between seasons. Water holding structures. If you have a steep garden, you may dig horizontal trenches, which are called sways. And in my case, they are filled with wood chips. I've got five of sways like this. And the soil I dig up when I uh, make a swale, I put it down the slope and I plant trees on it. And because water gets collected in a swale, I will show you um, a diagram in a moment. Um, it feeds the soil, which is below the swale. And it sort of percolates into the ground really slowly. And even in the, after really dry days, when I dig through the wood strips, I will see it's really moist. There could be even water um, at the bottom of the swale. So this is how a swale look like. I also use swales to take uh, the water, uh, the overflow from my rainwater tanks. So they go into swales. And again, that would go into the soil. And uh, I also use the overflow from my pond, which has got a little overflow. So the water does not go over the top. The overflow also goes to a swale. So basically, that's where I planted most of my perennials and the fruit trees on the swale system because they hold water. You can use bog gardens. So you can uh, create a garden, part of garden or sunken garden, which will um, hold water. And uh, you will grow plants which can deal with being covered with water completely. So you can grow edibles, water chestnut, watercress, arrowroot, or you can just plant native bog plants, which will sort of dry out if it's a heat wave and it's really dry, and then they will re-sprout 
when after rain, your uh, bog garden fills up. And rain garden, it's a similar variety, but it could be put in a raised garden bed. And it's for filtering water, which comes from um, your drainage pipes or overflow or gutters. So it will be released slowly into the rest of the garden. So again, you avoid the water just running off the surface of your garden. Self-watering garden beds. This is absolutely great thing. Um, and this is how I grow majority of my vegetables. I've got 11 raised garden beds and eight of them are self-watering on weaking beds. And that's where I grow most of my annuals. So, you know, all the typical veg you usually buy from a supermarket. So the water reservoir is under the soil. So you've got pipes, you can have pebbles or special plastic uh, forms like water apps. Then you put um, non-woven weed mat, something like uh, ag fabric or geotextile, and you put soil on top. I usually put a layer of vermiculite and the water level sort of touches the vermiculite when I top it up through a pipe. And then the water gets wicked up into the soil. So usually, um, the highest level of soil here would be 30, 40 centimeters because uh, the water cannot get weaked against gravity much higher than that. But it's absolutely great. It saves me a lot of watering because the water is always deep in the soil. So it encourages plants to grow long root system to reach the water. And if you only water from the top, that encourages the plants to spread the roots pretty shallow. And if it gets really hot or you go away on holidays, nobody waters your garden, your plants die. So deep watering, it's always the best. Self-watering vertical gardens. This is my garden, this is my friend's garden. It's basically pots which are hanging in a poly pipe. They are not standing in water. So each pot has got two weeks which are made from a uh, fabric, geotextile, or uh, something like old polars, not natural fibers because they would decompose. So the pipe is blocked from both sides and it's got a little hole in the side, which is uh, like an overflow. And, uh, and then um, I basically take out one of the pots, fill up the pipe, put the pot in, and all pots are fed with water through the wicks, which are in the pots. So um, actually this uh, art article about this has been published in the Renew magazine. I think it was about two years ago. So you can also use this when you don't have access to a lot of garden or your garden, it's really shady, but you've got a lot of sun on the walls of your house. So you can grow your food on the walls. Now recycling water, you can use your garden to recycle your gray water. And a lot of people are aware of that, but it does not have to be very technical. So you can bury the pipes under mulch and you can uh, direct the water straight into plants and it's mostly fruit trees which are watered that way. But you can also filter it. So you can use, for example, recycled and filtered gray water to top up your pond or you know some other area which needs a lot of water. So for example, this is a setup of one of my friends. So where you see this dot, that's where her house is. And she's got her um, laundry water going into a reed bed, which is full of uh, little pebbles. And she has planted uh, native uh, reeds, which are plants which use nutrients from the water, but they also add oxygen to the water uh, through the root system. So this is from the time when she started the system, but now it's just overgrown, just full of reeds and the water runs through overflow into this trench, which is a swale, and it feeds her um, fruit trees. So she saves gray water, filters it, not using anything technical, basically just plants. And uh, this clean water is then used to water her fruit trees. So you can also direct gray water, not even clear, obviously you want, you want to use um, normal commercial laundry powders. You probably are aware of that. You need low phosphorus, sort of ecological. You can get 
uh, washing powders and liquids which are designed for a uh, closed system and so on. So such gray water can be diverted to composting pits and composting pit is basically large hole in the ground. In my case, it's about one meter wide and about one meter deep. And I surrounded it with bananas and pawpaws. And uh, inside the pit, I just throw all weeds from the garden, which cannot go into compost. So, you know, things with rhizomes, with seeds, and, uh, and you could use gray water to put in the system and basically grow a lot of fruit, not really watering it uh, in other ways. So just using gray water. Other ideas to grow food and uh, to keep um, your water use pretty small, it's aquaponic system, which is combination of hydroponic system and aquaculture. So this is uh, again, my friend's place. She's got a large fish tank under her balcony where she grows uh, silver perch. And the water, which is full of nutrients because you know of, uh, of the uh, fish manure, it's pumped up. And here on the, uh, on the uh, terrace, on the balcony, she's got a garden bed, which is filled with pebbles and special bacteria which converts uh, the uh, uh, nitrates or ammonia from the manure into compounds which can be uh, used by plants and the water goes through it and it's filtered by the plants, it's oxygenated and all goes back to the fish tank. So I'm just going to show you a little setup, that's how it looks like. So you get a special bacteria like nitrosomonas um, so the nitrate from ammonia from uh, the manure, it's converted into nitrates, which the plants can take up. And then you get bell siphon. So when the water level reaches sort of just below um, the level of the pebbles, the siphon empties the water into uh, the fish tank. So, you know, I could talk about the water waste garden for about four hours, but I guess my time is nearly up, just checking. So another thing, which again, that will be like one hour talk, go to sustainabletable.org.au website. Because even if you don't grow your own food, this website gives you some uh, hints how to limit um, the cost of water and energy cost of your food. So how to basically lower your ecological footprint, which is related to what you eat. So where to shop, eating less meat, if you only eat meat twice a week, you reduce your um, food related footprint uh, by 40%. It's as simple as that. Buy seasonal stuff because it's not imported, reduce food waste, compost food scraps. And if you don't have your own garden to do composting, use a service, a swapping service, which is called um, Share Waste. And basically it links people who have waste, they cannot compost themselves. And people who would happily take this waste, it could be community gardens, larger gardens like mine, farmers. So, you know, you could get rid of your waste as well. Um, ethically raised and sustainable meat and seafood. It's a good source again of uh, a reduction of your footprint. Grow your own food, always. Eat whole foods, so not processed, not flowers, but grains. Avoid packaging. A lot of energy goes towards packaging and especially plastic. Um, and obviously in general, refuse, reduce, reuse, you know, the mantra of uh, not creating more waste and ask questions about where your food comes from. So that's from me. And you can have this information if you ever want to contact me. I believe it will be also published um at the end of this presentation so that's, that's from me that's awesome margaret that's well done um thank you very much for that, that was, i found it quite interesting uh, i'm sure i'm sure other people did as well um where um 10,000 10, liters of um of per uh, person per person per, person per, per year per day, per day. Um, I, I'd, I'd heard a i'd heard a recent thing which said which said 2000 liters and i thought that was pretty pretty um over the top but 10000 liters that's what 10000 like, liters it's by, by uh, it's calculation by stockholm water institute mm, it's mm. worldwide institute which does research on water it's 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 absolutely amazing um look thanks very much for that for that uh, talk and i'm sure you'll get uh, quite a few questions um, coming through on coming through on that one because I think it's opened people's minds. Um, it's and very it actually, different. Oh yeah, 
And it actually um, now um, segues quite nicely into um, the talk we have from uh, from Roman. Um, so uh, again, we have uh, we have Roman uh, Spur from um, the Spurtopia uh, Homestead, who's also aiming to be self-efficient in energy, water, food, and waste free. So he's going to have a very very similar um, related uh, views on the use of water in, in, in that whole sustainability sector. So, uh, Roman, you have um, about uh, 20 minutes um, starting from about now. Um, so I'll introduce you to Roman and you can start your presentation right now. Thanks. Uh, hello, Michael. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope that you are fine today. And uh, I am aiming to uh, inspire you to, um, uh, to grow your own organic food and obviously uh, save a lot of, a lot of water. Um, but I also would like to share with you some uh, ideas, uh, inventions, knowledge and experience and empower you to make a difference. And at the end of the day, uh, I would like you to think out of the box. So uh, the first thing uh, to know about household, uh, if we're looking at a, a, a water consumption, where all the water goes to, and uh, nearly half of uh, household, average household uh, water consumption goes into the garden. And then you can see the, the bathroom and uh, laundry, uh, just the proportions of the other half. So uh, on average, uh, average household will use about 900 liters per day, while our household uh, use around 230 liters, uh, which is about 25% of average Australian uh, water consumption. Um, here is a bit of story. Uh, when we arrived to Australia uh, 12 years ago, we actually um, established ourselves in Brisbane city uh, where we rented a unit uh, in a new farm. And um, there was a small backyard. So for most people, they would say, oh, renting and uh, don't have a land to grow you can't do too much, but uh, you will see how, uh, how much you can do and everyone can do. There is no excuse. So uh, this is the layout of the place. And uh, you can see that uh, the, actually the vegetable garden is very small. Uh, and we had a large concrete yard and shed. So not, not a lot of space, but um, we managed uh, to grow more than half of our family food uh, consumption in this small backyard. And we actually produce even excess, which we share um, with the others. Um, so here, here we go about um, rainwater harvesting. And um, uh, I actually would like to point out, everyone has got a, a uh, rainwater tanks, either large or small, like these IBC tanks. Uh, but that's what we did in our rental property. That's the uh, downpipe, uh, stormwater downpipe, which we kind of diverted into these uh, IBCs. There are three of them. And um, obviously, when you are harvesting rainwater, um, the first flush is always dirty water and you don't really want to use it as a drinking water. So how does that work here? So what goes into the first tank from the top through the T-section? And it's kind of sealed off. So when um, this rainwater tank fills up, it actually, uh, fill, water starts to flow into the second one. And then, oops, um, then when that one fills up, it will overflow into the third one. Uh, so the third one, you can see it's covered in a, in a black uh, plastic and that stops algae growing there. And that was our uh, drinking water. The first two IBC tanks we actually used for the garden. Uh, so when you think about it, the first flush, uh, there are the systems um, uh, which actually first flush would be say something like 
maybe 10 liters of water, but uh, 10 liters will definitely not be enough uh, to harvest clean water when the air is polluted and when the roof is polluted. So when you think about it, two cubic meters of water, that's, I think, uh, very good to, to get uh, the clean water uh, for drinking, even in the city. Okay. And actually, how we got this um, water from these tanks into the garden, uh, there is a, a, a swimming pool hose connected to them, and uh, by gravity, actually, it flows into the garden. And I used actually a vacuum cleaner pipe to get uh, to have um, gravity fed irrigation system, so I can I could walk around the garden and water it. Uh, when we're talking about gray water uh, from washing machine or sh showers, what we really want to do is um, uh, to use it straight away. Once you store it for, uh, say, uh, more than 24 hours, it will go stagnant and it will kind of go off, which we don't really want to. So in this case, um, what we did, we didn't have um, uh, the flexi hose long enough. So I actually uh, connected that to the uh, bucket. And of that bucket, I actually made a hole with a, a green garden hose, which actually went all the way down to the garden. So in that way, uh, we actually, in a rental property, we actually could use gray water uh, to water our garden. You can also use um, a swimming pool sand filter to, um, to water the gray water from a uh, gray water tank and then use it later on. I will talk about it shortly. So here are some ideas for you when we're talking about um, self-watering wicking. Uh, you can use a milk container as a wicking pot and you cut it half, you make a hole in a lid and put there a piece of fabric and uh, the bottom part is water storage, the top part, soil and plant growing. So that's very simple. If you hold about half a liter of water, you always will see how much water is left. So it doesn't need to be uh, top up every day, maybe once in a week. But being an engineer, um, sustainable design engineer, uh, my, uh, for me, it's not enough. So um, using all available resources, so this is actually um, plastic 20 liter drum from cooking oil from our local restaurant. And what I did, I actually chopped the top off and made a holes and a couple of holes for the legs uh, where, uh, and put it into, sorry, into the, uh, into the uh, drum. This black pipe is there to get, um, uh, to get water in. And you have got 20 liter self-watering plant pot uh, where you can grow whatever you like. So the next slide is look uh, how uh, we had a brick wall which looked really awful, but with this um, wicking pots, it actually all of a sudden turned quite well. Um, looking at Margaret's presentation, uh, we also used vertical garden as a, as a uh, poly pipe, stormwater pipe, and uh, grew strawberries there. But um, as a water storage there, I actually use um, macadamia shelves uh, as a half of that pipe filled up at the bottom. Uh, that was a water storage. And water actually was automatically supplied from this um, uh, plastic uh, plastic bottle, so uh, it actually uh, could go without watering for quite a long time. But again, it's not weeks, and uh, for me that's not enough. So I went further, and was using this um, or still using this uh, styrofoam box uh, as a uh, self-watering plant box. And everyone can make it um, because it's so simple, very light. You can uh, port, uh, transport it. Uh, you can use whatever material. It doesn't need to be in styrofoam box. I just use that because I could uh, get hold of it. Uh, in essence, this self-watering plant box, uh, that's a lid which is cut to fit. And there are PVC pipes uh, as a legs, but also as a wicks. 
you don't need to have a PVC pipe. What you can do is to have a planter pot and the lid uh, would be sitting on these pots. So the lid goes in um, like upside down. So that creates water storage. And um, then you fill it up with soil to all the way to the top. But the most important part is that the soil needs to go down to these pipes because that will create a wick. Uh, and uh, the state of the art technology, you can see here a float, which is wooden skewer and styrofoam off cut. That will tell you how much water is left in the styrofoam box. And uh, also the styrofoam box will have an overflow hole, as you can see that here. And that um, is at the same height or slightly below the, uh, the suspended, uh, the raised floor where the water storage is. So the idea is that water will never reach the actual soil in the box. It will be always lower. Uh, I took it even further because that box will uh, store about 10 liters of water, but uh, made a double box or triple box. And the same principle, the bottom storage, the bottom box is the water storage. Uh, in this instance, uh, the second box has got a pipes going all the way down. You have to stack it up, not like that, but you know, you stack it uh, on the top of each other. And um, the third box, I cut uh, the bottom of it off. So you have got about uh, half a meter depth of uh, soil. So you can grow there even a root vegetable or a small fruit trees. Um, so what we did with that, uh, we actually created a fruit and vegetable pyramid on a concrete. And even uh, though it's in a full sun in summer, uh, the plants are still happy because uh, they've got constant supply of water. But you can use any materials. As I said, um, here is a blue drum, 200 liter drum, which I cut half, and the same principle Half of it is a water storage, the bottom part, the top part is um, soil and growing even dwarf bananas in it. Yeah. Um, here is how it's actually done, a mesh, a uh, few uh, um, stormwater pipes as a legs and geofabric to hold um, soil there. I, uh, the other one we actually cut alongside uh, and um, had it as a water storage, the same principle, had a larger root um, uh, uh, growing area. And you can see even a self-seeded popo growing out of it uh, with four pineapples. And we're already getting pineapples of it. Um, here is an idea about, another idea about uh, watering fruit trees, uh, deep watering fruit trees into the root zone. So um, rather than standing with a hose and watering that from the top, um, you've got a um, copper pipe, which I actually uh, bend it at the, at the bottom and create it like a, um, like a spray. Uh, and I poke it in the ground, uh, say 20 centimeters deep. So that will actually deliver water directly to the root zone of the plants or of the trees. So um, uh, in that way, it's much more effective. Um, that's uh, our place um, when we started, uh, 2009, and that um, is the place a few years down the line. So you can see uh, that uh, you can create your paradise uh, even in a small space. But um, then we actually uh, got, um, we actually bought our new place uh, in in Fernwell, which is about one hour drive west from Brisbane, um, where we have got one acre. And uh, we actually established the whole place as a sustainable place. And um, there is so much uh, to share with you. So I will go through it quickly. So that's, uh, that's the layout of the place. It's triangle um, shape of the land. and. Um, it's on a slope, so we're actually using slope to adv our advantage. And um, very, very important when you're setting up uh, your, your property, it's very, very important to have a vision. And that's what we did here. 
Uh, there are a few uh, slight changes. Uh, for example, dam is not there because council would not allow us to build dam unless we fence it off like a swimming pool, but we can go around that uh, in different ways. Um, so the first thing we actually um, got uh, rainwater tanks in, which is uh, these two uh, all the, uh, are 22,500 meters each. And uh, I had to connect uh, the, the roof to them. So a fair bit of work, good exercise, keeps me fit. And uh, that's how we started. And from our experience, we found that uh, these two tanks would be enough to run the whole household, uh, family of five, uh, throughout the whole year, just on a rainwater. Um, and these are uh, just the beginnings where we had uh, these as a self-watering planter boxes, um, where we actually could grow, some, uh, could grow something green. And uh, that's, uh, that's uh, how we started. And obviously a lot of compost and uh, compost as Margaret already mentioned, uh, would store a huge amount of uh, water in a soil. So the more organic matter, the more water you store in a, in a soil. And that's how we actually started our kitchen garden. And uh, you can see the slope. This is our veggie garden. And that's, that veggie garden is actually built on a septic overflow gravel sucking area, whatever you want to call it. And the weeds were growing like mad, um, and I had to whippersnip that every week. So I said, like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. Uh, so built a raised garden bed. And uh, the point here is that um, uh, plants which has got larger root systems, like tomatoes or zucchinis, they will tap into the moisture of that. So you don't need to water them at all. Um, we also uh, built swells on the property to retain a uh, run of water. And um, it was a lot of hard work and improving the soil as well, because uh, nothing will grow in the soil apart from gum trees. Um, and you will see you know, how the swells work. Actually, uh, that's how they actually hold water. And uh, we have got three of them. So when one is full, it will overflow into the second one and into the third one. Um, in this instance, we had over 250 mil of rain uh, and it wasn't um, established yet. So you can see how it actually was breaking through, but now uh, the swells look completely different. So here are some uh, ideas for you, how you can build your self-watering raised garden beds. Um, in this instance, um, a plastic liner, uh, builder's liner and hardwood wood chips. Um, they will actually uh, um, uh, stay as they are for, a, for several years before they break down. Then I put a shade cloth on top. Uh, you can use a geofabric even better and the soil. Uh, the agi pipe is there to uh, distribute water into the uh, wood chips. You can even improve on that uh, to put uh, alongside the stormwater pipes, uh, one next to each other. and. Um, uh, between them, the hardwood wood chips go into, so you've got far more water storage. The difference between hardwood wood chips and pebbles is, or in general, that the pebbles would take up to 70% of uh, uh, water storage space. So only 30% is actually water storage, while uh, wood chips would actually soak up and um, you've got more water stored in that way. Uh, here is another idea. Uh, I always use materials which I have available. So I uh, have got these bricks uh, with these holes and um, uh, grills. And each brick with the, each hole is actually a wick. So fill that up with dirt and then um, put the soil in. And that's the final result. So uh, the advantage of this system is um, that um, it will store uh, maximum amount of water in that uh, bottom reservoir. So most of most of the space is just water storage. Instead of bricks, uh, I, on the other uh, garden bed, I actually used uh, planter pots. This say 15 centimeter diameter, about 15 centimeters tall. And uh, when they are filled up with uh, dirt, they are structural, so they will not collapse and they will hold the weight of the soil. 
Um, here is our uh, energizing mandala pyramid. And that's another way uh, using another material uh, to, uh, to make a wicking garden beds. Um, and as you can see on, on top right, um, use the bricks to support uh, the stripes of uh, corrugated iron. I didn't have a um, um, mesh, steel mesh, so I used a stri strips of corrugated iron and uh, made the gaps between. And then on the top, uh, I actually put um, the, sh the shade cloth and the shade cloth goes uh, down into the gap and up, creates like a pocket for soil to go in. And that actually creates a linear dick. So I created the whole uh, pyramid into the few sections. So just in case one uh, will, um, will start to leak, uh, the other ones are still working. Um, here is a, another idea for you. And that's self, uh, herb spiral. Uh, herb spiral is very old uh, idea, but what is innovative about this herb spiral is self-watering. Um, in this schematic, you can see it has got actually three layers uh, or three water reservoir in three layers. And this is how we actually build it from, uh, from uh, zero to all the way uh, to the top. Use a uh, recycled carpet from the house as a stones, as a water storage, and dirt around. So that was our first layer. And then we started another layer, the same way, uh, and the third layer. And finally, we actually achieved the herb pile. We just got uh, three water reservoirs. And I can tell you, it really, really works. Uh, here is a bathtub. Uh, you can convert a bathtub into a beautiful garden bed. And um, uh, I actually silicon. <laughs> silicon in the, uh, the, the tube to get uh, to keep water in and uh, it's the same height as um, as uh, the grill. So uh, the planter pots are there as a wicks and um, they also hold uh, the, the, um, the wire mesh uh, and geofabric actually holds soil. Um, so these, these uh, recycled bathtub, they would hold up to 100 liters of water. And uh, they are great for growing cucumbers, for example, because um, cucumbers uh, will need the water all the time. And that's where, where they get it from. So that's the kitchen garden, uh, the, uh, continuing the story. That's how it looked before. And uh, that's uh, when we actually kind of established that. Yeah, that's the bigger picture. Uh, that's the veggie garden um, when it, it was kind of established and that's one year later on. You can see uh, it's, it's, it's actually changing and not using as much water. Uh, that's another view at the property and you can see how everything is actually growing. Um, coming from Europe, uh, you, using, uh, this is a different way of environment and have to start a uh, the view at a gardening in different way. So for, for us, wicking is like a no brainer. Uh, that's the way to go because it will save a lot, a lot of um, water and energy. Um, so Roman, we're pretty much running out of time now. We, we, yeah, I will just to... finish it in, yep. in a minute. Okay, yeah, no worries, thank mate. Thank you. So that's uh, that's the uh, that's the comparison uh, to when we bought it and two years down the line. Another photo. Uh, at the moment, oh, that's another way of uh, watering. Uh, here are the water wise tips. Deep watering definitely uh, create a shape, um, a shade uh, in summer. Uh, at uh, as much compost as you can and mulch, mulch, mulch. Um, water harvesting systems use the rainwater rather than uh, using town water and so on. So yeah, plenty of things to share uh, and uh, plenty of uh, things to inspire people. So I hope that I got you inspired and thinking about how uh, you, can, you can actually uh, grow your own food and save a lot of water. Excellent. Thanks very much, Roman. That was amazing and, and such a great follow on from from the presentation that Margaret gave uh, gave earlier about um, about using 
sustainability on your own property to to save water. And, and if we can do some of the things that you've done on that property, then um, we can save thousands and thousands of litres of water per person per day, um, as, Margaret, as Margaret said. So some really great ideas there. Look, let's move on now and we'll get, uh, we'll invite uh, um, the, um, the presenters so far. Um, and Dennis, please, Keep trying because if we can get you in on the panel discussion, that would be great as well. Um, but we'll also get in um, Eric from the um, from the Earth Care Centre to um, to come in and we'll do a bit of a Q and A. So we've had some Q and A questions come through uh, during the presentations, and um, we're just going through some of those some of those now. And there was a there was a question very early on in Margaret's presentation, which was. Um, from Julian about how safe is roof sourced water. Now, both Margaret and um, and Roman um, mentioned uh, doing uh, getting cold of that water and using it on the garden or diverting it somewhere else because it might have some contaminants in it. Perhaps um, Margaret, if you could just have to spend a, a minute or two explaining about what the potential issues are with the water and, and Roman following on from that, and then I might get. Um, um, Eric to uh, to to come in and, and talk about that as well, and as well as that, um, the, um, someone wanted to also uh, recommend a brand of laundry and dishwashing detergent for the grey water systems. So, Margaret, if I can pass it over to you okay. uh, first. Thanks, Michael. Um, regarding uh, how safe the water is, um, if you are familiar with Michael Mobs Sustainable House, he is in Chippendale near the centre of Sydney. And he actually did testing of the water quality in terms of chemicals compared to normal city water. And despite being in an older part of, of the town where you know a lot of traffic and previously um, lead, um, lead gasoline vehicles were, still the water from his roof was better than the city water. So that's the first thing. Second thing, you have to make sure that you don't have lead on your roof. And I do have some lead, so I only take water from about um, half of my roof because I've got lead flashings around the chimney, which I plan to remove, but uh, that's what I've got. So things to be aware of, it's, uh, you may check the quality of the dust in your area. And you may try to collect some dust, you know, just set up some sort of container open to, to the elements and get dust that way. Or you may check uh, Michael's mob book and uh, also contact him and check, you know, how he tested. Uh, what is also important, which also Roman has mentioned, is having the first flash diverter. So the first water which falls uh, when the rain starts, it's the dirtiest water. It will have some, you know, uh, animal droppings, bird droppings, dust, whatever residues on your roof. And uh, I also divert my water before it hits the water tanks. And another thing, if you use it uh, for drinking water on the way from the rainwater tanks into your home, it's a good idea to have filters. So that's all my advice about. Uh, mm. Thanks, thanks Margaret. From the roof. Roman, do you have anything further to add to that? Okay. Uh, I would add um, the first flush diverters, uh, as you would usually get installed, they are not enough because uh, it's, say, something like 90 uh, mil pipe, two meters long. So that will hold maybe if, if a lot, something like five liters of water. So five liters of water and then uh, water goes into your rainwater tank. Uh, and five liter is definitely not enough uh, for cleaning the roof and uh, have a clean water from, um, from air which is polluted. So I, I definitely think that you need to have a much larger um, first flush uh, volumes um, before you actually uh, get it into your rainwater tank. Uh, if you do that in this way, then um, I think that you don't really even need to have a filter on your rainwater tank because it's literally distillated water. And well, it, it, uh, depends, would, it depends on the bacterial growth in your tanks. Uh, true, but if if um, there is if there is um, uh, no lights or no algae growing, and what we actually do with our uh, um, rainwater tank water for drinking, 
we actually uh, put it in a in a vessel and leave it in sun for about three hours. And actually sunshine provides UV, which would put, kill potential bacteria, which could be there. Not only that, it would energize and um, other elements would, would be added. And we actually have it in our energizing pyramid. So that's uh, another, uh, another level of thinking. But um, then we also put it into a, like a ceramic vessel uh, which is completely enclosed. And there we have um, um, crystals or, or mm. stones, which actually remineralize this, um, this uh, drinking water as well. Okay. So it basically depends on how big is the part of the roof you are collecting water from. And then you have to calculate back to know how big the diverter volume should be. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so um, Eric, you, we've got um, water diverting systems on the Earth Care Center. Um, and so, how do you man how do you guys manage that there? Yeah, well, we 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 actually have town water because um, we're in the Hawkesbury area on the campus of Western City University. So we're actually on the peri-urban. So we're sort of like in the country a fair bit. So already there's a lot less, I think, you know, like diesel fumes and things coming into the water. So so the particles and the pollution is less to begin with. But we're also on town water. And um, we also had a dam down the back that we were using for irrigation as well uh, with a windmill pump. But the, the tank itself, uh, yeah, we would have just the first flush device too. But, uh, you know, Roman's point is really interesting too. You know, the calcul calculating the volume, I think, is really important too. And that's like the surface area of your roof, you know, coupled with, um, you know, the amount of pollution you expect to get there and then, um, and then take that, divert that water somewhere else. So, uh, yep. yeah. And there were a few other questions coming through on some of the other chat lines um, about UV sterilization. I think we've covered that with, with Roman. Um, he does his in the sunlight, but there are, there are commercial systems around which can help um, sterilize and treat uh, drinking water and make it potable. Uh, and so you should always, always uh, follow the directions of your local councils and you should always um, take into account um, the, the safety of drinking water and make sure that you are, confident that it's safe for you, not just you to drink but for other people to drink as well so um there was also the associated thing with the uh, gray house uh, gray house the um the um gray water um uh with uh, recommending a brand of laundry and dishwashing detergent do you have a view on that eric have you got any um lists of those i know ata put out a list of your renew put out a list a few years ago yeah it's interesting because they you know um i've got actually got a system at home too where i've got a composting toilet and a a reed bed and and indeed uh the gray water i mean to be phosphate free is not necessarily all good because i've got plants in there too and you know they can do with a bit of phosphorus too so low amounts of phosphorus is okay but if you really want to avoid them then i think it's pretty clear usually what what's low phosphorus and um and there's a lot of products in the market that uh, i think the competition's there that it's easy to pick a product that's going to be relatively um you know unpolluted i think for your for your gray water but yeah but if you've got the fish in there too you need to be extra careful too don't you mm, i'm interested that's... in margaret's comment about yeah. the, the bacteria too you know how she gets that bacteria in there because um they are effectively you know converting that material into a plant available source too you can get the bacteria from other people who have aquaponic system or you can buy them in a powder form hmm. And so, Margaret, you yeah. actually specifically mentioned before about the um, about you know uh, laundry detergents that that um, that we should look for. Um, do you have a, a? We're not endorsing brands, by, by the way. This is not an endorsement of particular brands, but are there brands that you have used in the past which have, which have worked for you, for example? Um, all right, I don't have a grey water system because I would need to pump it uphill. My okay. house is at the lowest point of the garden. The garden is up from the house. So I don't actually use the gray water. I plan to do um, a reed bed below the house in the front garden. But uh, at this stage, I basically just use low, low phosphorus. And, uh, you know, I use a lot of natural stuff. Like I make my own washing powders from washing soda and other components. 
So uh, probably people who have gray water systems will be better than that. I would say using uh, products which are labeled as either low phosphorus, low boron, and also for, for septic tank use would be yep. the best indication. Eric Roman, do you agree? Because I don't have much experience with that. Yeah, um, I don't, are they still using oh. boron in, in detergents now? Because I think it's... It's pretty recognised that it's uh, there's other ways to get the effect of of boron. I don't know. Without... I just I just seen someone's comment in the chat. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed, yeah. and it's interesting. Yeah, yeah uh, we actually make our own uh, detergent. It's made from uh, washing soda, um, soap, and a bit of borax. Uh, the exact recipe is on our website. Yeah. But uh, um, borax is a boron, and it's toxic when it's in huge quantities. <clears throat> But we have to also bear in mind that uh, the soil is depleted here uh, in Australia from all the minerals. So mm -hmm. it actually needs a bit of boron um, to, um, in, in, in a garden. And if you don't um, uh, discharge the gray water into the same spot, you're actually uh, bringing the boron into the soil. And to give you an idea, in terms of uh, boron, uh, a tree would need uh, something like a tablespoon of borax uh, mm. a year. Yeah, so that gives you an idea, um, you know, how much uh, you can use. So because we actually make our own detergent, we are happy to use on our garden because we know what goes in. Mm. Okay, yeah? that's that's yeah. And and the other thing is, I suppose it comes back down to you know read the label on on the on on the thing and. And the soil, soil health is, is, can be a fairly complex subject. Um, and so there are some other resources. Now, I know that Renew a few years ago did a few uh, studies and, or had studies done to recommend uh, ranges and types of laundry powders. I'm not sure if that's up to date, but I think we do have a, a, a reference to a website uh, somewhere which we can probably um, um, jump out, uh, dig out uh, and, uh, and, and publish uh, at some point in time uh, for that. Uh, we had some other questions uh, concerning um, uh, foods and everything. Um, one was, um, and again, this will probably come back to, uh, I'll open it up to, to everybody, but Margaret and, and, and uh, Roman have already spoken a bit about it, about, specifically about vertical gardens. So what, um, how do vertical gardens um, cope with being on a west facing wall and, and what consideration needs to be made for the, for the heat? in the afternoon sun. So perhaps Margaret jump in there first and then we'll follow with Roman and then Eric. <laughs> I think someone has posted a link to the Renew article on, on my vertical garden. That's the, one, uh -huh. that's the one when I use um, pots sitting in separate slots in a poly pipe. Mm -hmm. And uh, that gives enough volume of the soil and also a lot of water sitting under that I have my plants on dark brick wall facing Northeast. That gets very hot. Mm. So mm. not even, you know, Western sun, but um, even Northeast, it's, it's very hot. So um, I have no problems. And so the water doesn't get too warm. What happens when the water gets warm inside the pipes? No, um, you, can, you can actually paint the pipes because I use uh, the orange pipes, which I use to store electrical cables underground. So my pipes are 15 centimeters across. They are bigger than gathering pipes, so they hold more water. And if you paint them in a light color, which reflects the sun, that would also help. You could also paint the wall behind the plant. Mm -hmm. You know, you paint the wall of where your vertical garden is, or you can put some sort of board painted white. So it's there for summer and in winter you remove it. So the wall it's warmer in winter. But I okay. don't have any problems. I mostly grow strawberries. I grow some medic medicinal herbs like coltsfoot. I grow um, capsicums. So I grow a variety of plants, but you have to remember that the root system has to sort of fit the pot. You can mm -hmm. uh, have the pot a little bit smaller than the normal root system because you know the soil is rich, you add compost. You can also add the fertilizer like, uh, um, warm castings and warm we to the water which sits in a polypipe so you can actually fertilize with the water the plants take up okay um yeah and, and roman you specifically mentioned uh, the vertical plants in your garden yeah uh what uh i actually like uh the margaret's idea what i would improve on especially on a western facing facade 
um, I would definitely uh, if at least painted the pots because if the pots are black, you're literally cooking uh, the root system. Yeah. They are gray. So they are silver, so gray, one, and pink, and and uh, light blue. Yeah. So one uh, painted. Uh, the other one, what you can use is actually pot in a pot. So uh, in this case, you would need to kind of cut off the bottom of a larger pot, which would go in over the over the existing pot. So the air cavity between the pots will create insulation. Or you can use a Hessian bag or whatever to mm -hmm. cover the whole thing. And in that way, uh, you're actually keeping the root system cooler and uh, the plants will grow better. Yeah, I've noticed that when I've got a, a large collection of pots and you know, 10, 15, 20 pots of various sizes, the ones in the middle do much better than the ones on the outside mm -hmm. because they're probably protected from that temperature. Eric, did you have another comment for, uh, to add to that? Uh, no, not really, because um, I mean, like I said, we're in a peri-urban area, and so really we have, you know, we have a, a, a hectare of land, and so there's plenty of space to grow lots of things, and you know, and, and I guess the old permaculture principles apply, don't they? You know, zone one, you try to pack it in, yeah, but, yeah. But I think that stuff on the outside wall has the effect also of, of insulating the inside of the building as well, too. That's another like the, advantage, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but very tricky, as 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 Roman and Margaret said too. You know, I mean, the, the volume of soil you've got there to put the to put those roots in. You know, you can cook plants very easily. Yeah, here's a question I think is specifically for Margaret. Um, Nicholas has asked, "Have you tried growing mushrooms as a protein source, and what's the water demands for mushrooms?" From I haven't tried growing mushrooms because I actually go and pick wild mushrooms. Okay. So I'm a mushroom picker, so no, never tried growing them. And uh, the setup for the mushrooms, probably the easiest ones to grow are oyster mushrooms in buckets. Because you don't need to be very careful with them, you know, when it comes to sterilization of uh, um, the environment and uh, a lot of water. I actually grow some oyster mushrooms in a bucket in my bathroom. <laughs> Just, okay. to, just to check how it grows, but I'm not a very <laughs> experienced grower of mushrooms because I mostly pick them wild, freeze some, dry some, pickle, ferment, so I always have them. We had a friend who accidentally grew mushrooms in their bathroom once. Yeah, that was another story. <laughs> <laughs> on, on this topic, uh, if I can uh, yep. add, uh, you could actually grow mushroom, uh, sorry, oyster mushrooms uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a coffee grounds. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you can yeah. actually yeah. utilize coffee grounds in that. Uh, but even better, uh, you can go and get uh, mushroom compost from mushroom farm. And they're growing uh, these mushrooms in, in the bags. And when, the, when they are exhausted, they're actually getting rid of the bags and uh, putting there a new ones. So you can buy usually uh, these bags for $2. And if you actually place them under the house or somewhere in a cool area and cover it, you will still get about uh, a kilo of mushrooms out of it. And as a bonus, uh, you will get uh, a, uh, you will get a mushroom compost eventually. Yeah. Mm. So that's something to consider as well. Okay. Um, so we've got we've got a few we've got a few questions coming in on, on various themes, and um, one of them was um, a really specific one for for Roman. Very quickly, um, you use the uh, their interest in the deep cop in the copper pipe you used for deep watering trees. How did you make that? Or is there some okay. of the people can is there some of the people can actually read about it perhaps on your website? Uh, I it should be on the website. If not, just send, uh, drop me an email and uh, I will send it to you. But I will try to explain. Uh, if you just uh, have a normal copper pipe and you poke it in the ground, you actually uh, plug it with the soil, and it will not really grow unless there is a huge pressure. Mm. So what I did, I actually cut say <laughs> half of this copper pipe um about two centimeters into the lens of the copper pipe yeah so cut that half off and with the other, other, other half i kind of created uh, like a lip yeah so uh it it actually uh, water uh, created like a hole uh to the sides if you know what i okay, mean okay yeah 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 i bend it over so in that way uh, you can poke it in the ground and uh, it will not pop Mm -hmm. if and you, do have, uh, you if connect you it uh, to a normal hose uh, through, uh, through a valve or whatever you want to, 
mm. what, uh, whatever materials you have available and uh, that's how you actually water uh, the fruit trees if you don't have enough water and you want to water the root system yeah yeah with if you should got, also bear in really, mind yes. sorry yeah, that's that right. we should uh, we should water uh, to the drip zone so that's usually where the canopy tree ends not yes. around the trunk that's uh, the feeding uh, roots of the trees are uh, at the end of the canopy of the, the drip line yeah yeah i was going to make yeah. a comment something like that uh, how how do you um, both margaret and and roman you've used um, wicking beds and so the question is from uh, from Emily and a few others, how do you avoid getting mosquito wrigglers into the wicking beds? Um, can't they just get down the pipe when you top up the water? I just cap the water, the pipe. I just, just put the, the cap, cap, or you can put a small, even a small potted plant, but I basically just uh, cap the, uh, um, the, pipe, the pipe through which I'm going to add water. That's all. Mm -hmm. Never and, get mosquitoes into my yeah. watering beds. And also, if you've got the outflow pipe, the overflow pipe from a wicking bed, it's a good idea to put something like a piece of um, fly screen over it. So yeah. you don't get mosquitoes getting in through the other end of the system. Yeah. Uh, and Rome, you do the same sort of thing? Or Eric, have um, you got... um, If you could see there is a float in this pipe to get water in, and that's styrofoam off cut, and that's around it as a pipe. So I am actually blocking, physically blocking uh, the mozzies to getting into the uh, water, uh, water storage at the bottom. Mm -hmm. This is the float. And um, in terms of um, the overflow hole, you either make it small enough. Uh, so you, in a styrofoam box, you just poke a screwdriver in uh, through the styrofoam. And uh, in that way, the, the, uh, the hole is small enough so the mozzies will not get in or you just put their um, uh, fly screen or something over it. Yeah. And and I, I do the similar thing with a, a tank I have, which is, um, it's just a, a 200 litre drum uh, that I use for as, as a tank to feed the, to water the chooks. Well, not water the chooks, but provide water for the chooks. Um, and it's just got an opening at the top and I've just got, I just made it, got a bit of wire and wrap, wrapped it in a circle and then wrapped a bit of shade cloth around it, just sits over the opening and that stops them as well. And it's just a small mm. stone on that to hold, to hold it in place. Um, and Eric, have you have that sort of issue with the, with your system at home? Um, well, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, earth care, we don't have wicking beds and I don't have a wicking bed here either, but, but yeah, I mean, you've got to be conscious in terms of, you know, the species of, of, my, of mosquitoes that really like and the volumes of water that they like to sit in. So mm -hmm. once the volumes get large enough, then other ecologies start to kick in and balance that, I think. And yeah. I've got a reed bed and I just make sure that there's no water at the surface. So it's all below the gravel and the plants come up on top of that. Yep, yep. All right. Yep. Yeah. Um, there was there were a couple, couple more questions, um, which I think we've answered, um, Margaret, about the lead on your roof. You were saying that you avoid collecting water from that section of your roof. Yes. Um, and so, if you, how, how do you know that you're that, that that you're not getting that water, sort of coming from other parts of the roof? Did you actually check out the water flow on the roof, or you just block well, those my my, off? my roof has got like four parts. It's oh, okay. not flat roof. It's an old house. It's actually retrofitted nineteen thirty six house. Okay. So I just take water from about 40% of the roof, which is sort of like two uh, parts of the roof and the other two, uh, I've got solar panels on one of them. And then I've got a chimney surrounded by lead. So it's easier for me because I don't have one bit of a roof or, you know, just, just two, um, like in some modern houses. Right, okay. And and the, the thing is now, these days, they don't use lead for, well, they're not supposed to, but they don't use lead flashing anymore anyway um, with yeah, modern but builds. but old houses, so, yeah. they do. With old houses, they do. Um, and in fact, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough because I've got a, a, a colour bond roof, so it's even, so I'll get even cleaner water than normal, so because I don't have tiles to worry about. Um, someone, uh, Emily asked, uh, how do you, how do you um, with the bath, I think it was Roman that had the bath, was it Roman that had the bath? Yeah. I can't, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you do the overflow on the bath um or how do you stop the whole bath from filling up in heavy rain okay uh if you could remember uh, there was a pipe in a in a hole of the of the bathtub which i silicon in and that pipe is the same height as uh, the pot which is like a leg uh, holding the uh, the uh, 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 the mesh and the geofabric yeah, so, so you drilled that. Then water the actually reached that height, 
it will overflow out through the uh, silicon in pipe out of the bathtub. Right. And that was when you drilled into yeah. the side of the yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the other one was um, you, you've made a lot of use. I mean, and well, everybody here has probably made use of um, recycled materials and everything. How do you go about evaluating the risk of, of toxic materials, plastics, metals in bathtubs and everything, which might leach into the food? How do you, how do you manage that? I might let you roam really quickly and then um, Margaret and then Eric. Uh, yeah. What I would say is um, nothing is ideal. So every plastic would lead something. If, it, if it's in a plant pot, fine. Uh, the styrofoam box, I'm not saying it's ideal, uh, but we have to bear in mind that the broccoli actually comes in direct contact uh, uh, in a styrofoam boxes. And now I think about it. Yeah? And my point is that if you grow even in the styrofoam boxes, the veggies from that would be thousand times better than veggies you buy in a shop shelf. Yeah? Mm. But you can actually use a cast iron bathtub or you know whatever material you would be comfortable with and uh, and use that i just using what i have got available obviously you know i i don't want to poison my family uh with the food growing in it um so uh, use a common sense yeah okay Ma margaret um, sorry, I've got, I was just answering a question. Um, no, okay. I don't really use plastic much in my garden. I do use aqua break, which is, uh, I think, type of polyester to line the wicking beds. And uh, I also use uh, recycled items, which would be mostly IBC containers, the same as Roman used. Um, I use them as freestanding containers for, um, for water running off my woodshed. So it's not a system connected to the house. I mostly use it for water in the garden, but this is a really hardy plastic and uh, it's also allow for food storage. So I don't worry about that much because it just stores water. It would react more if you put something acidic in this plastic like soil or uh, um, say uh, water from your compost, you know, something that contaminated with organic materials, but just plain water water would be fine. The other thing I recycle is uh, all the concrete uh, laundry tubs. Oh yeah. So I use them because they are good insulation against the heat. So mm -hmm. you know, unlike the metal uh, modern containers, so um, I use them. And in general, I use a lot of things I found in my favorite curbside markets, which people otherwise call pencil cleanup days. <laughs> I grow I grow my own bamboo for stakes and for, for you know small constructions around the garden, which lasts for a season or two. But otherwise um, I use styrofoam boxes, but mostly for um, growing seedlings. Mm -hmm. Just again, insulation properties. And so I have styrofoam boxes I've been using for several years, and then they go, unfortunately, they go to rubbish, but at least I extended mm. the use of the boxes. Yeah, we use a lot of styrofoam boxes for um, seedlings and plantings, and I have a friend who shares a greenhouse with me, and we use those for, well, he uses those for growing uh, succulents. So how do you, um, is, do you have a problem with the alkalinity out of the concrete from the concrete uh, plant um, laundry tubs, or are they so old now that they've Probably they, they, must be, they must be very old. One mm. looks like it's as old as my house. You know, you can judge by shape. One is more modern. So I would say probably 60, 70 years old. So whatever mm. was there probably leached out for yeah. ages. Yeah. And now there was... I grow mostly medicinal plants in them. Yeah. So Eric, do you use a lot of recycled material and, and, and how, do you, how do you deal with potential uh, toxic issues? Are you pretty comfortable with what you're using? Yeah, I mean, both here and indeed at, at Earthcare, we, we used a lot of recycled materials for obvious reasons, you know, because we want to re, you know, reuse stuff. And um, but in, in terms of toxicity, I mean, you've got to, you know, keep be sensible and and we source things, make sure that, you know, there's things like, you know, I guess heavy metals and 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 chlorinated, um, you know, you know, things like DDT and all those sorts of things. If you're wary of, you can avoid in the first place. But but I think. Um, I think our biology is really quite quite good, you know, because you tend to get biofilms and algae growing on things very quickly, and they, I would say that they buffer 
a lot of those things too. Yeah. And, and then there's the pH as well, because we know that things like heavy metals become more available at a lower pH. So in terms more of acidic. Making, yeah. yeah, more, that's right. The more acid it is, the more available these things. And, and indeed, we now know that, uh, you know, in terms of bioremediation now, we know that fungi are incredibly good at locking up heavy metals and, and, uh, and biochar too now as well, they're starting to use because that's also very good at locking up uh, you know, toxic materials for a very long periods of time. So, mm. but yeah, we live in a toxic world, you know, and that's, that's just the way we are. And I think you look at our bodies, you know, our bodies carry a lot of toxicity with it. And mm. so it gets back to a holistic lifestyle and really looking after yourself and, um, you know, reducing your stress, but eating good food and, and, you know, more of your own food too, I think. So it's the whole, the whole thing and a mindset too. I think, you know, our minds can really deal with toxic substances better if you are in a positive frame of mind too. Just one more thing uh, following yep. on Eric. You know, the, the very common uh, organism in the garden, slaters or the roly poly mm -hmm. bugs, they are very efficient in uh, absorbing heavy metals. In the bodies, they create organic compounds which do not dissolve in water. So they are actually used to clear <sighs> contaminated soil and uh, I also try to add as many of them as I find into my compost. So they also clear my compost of heavy metals if there are any there, because you know, I get straw from, uh, from growers, which I use with my rabbits and then in litter trays, and then it goes into compost. Yeah. So remember okay. that there is a lot of organisms living in the soil, like fungi, like the roly polies, which will uh, clean uh, the soil. Yeah. Mm. And the other thing to remember, the other thing, just in general, I suppose, in terms of um, potential contaminants in soil, um, and particularly, say, from grey water, um, which aren't necessarily as toxic, that um, if you're putting them onto plants where you're, even if edible plants, where you're eating the leaves and the fruit from those, like tr fruit trees and things, then mm. that's not going to cause anywhere near the problems as eating plants that grow on or under the soil, so root vegetables or something like that, where you could get those sorts of things concentrating. So it's also about intelligent use of the plants and where you put your grey water and other things things like that. On a, on a, on a related topic um, with that, we had, um, uh, Nicholas was asking earlier, um, when you're capturing, if you're capturing water in ag pipes, for example, in the ground under veggies and storing it for later use, is algae growth um, a problem or is it really worth it? Or are you just simply better off using swales as a better method anyway, Margaret, perhaps first? Um, algae would grow when they've got sunlight. If you've got yeah. ag pipes buried under soil, then you wouldn't have them. But usually the problem with any pipes in the soil is blockage by um, various animals, including ants, which like to oh, you know, build nests. And yes. So I, I prefer swales because they are so much easier. Mm -hmm. So the only maintenance, I just uh, top them up with wood chips, probably yep. once a year, once every one and a half year, depending how wet the year was or how quickly they decompose. But I would say anything that's buried underground would not have happened. <laughs> but may have lizards, anyone who has dealt with the water in you know, normal houses with dead lizards stuck inside, you know the smell. Mm, oh yeah, yeah. We've got a couple of comments. We've got a couple of questions and comments here that are that are quite related, um, and there were, were some in the comments as well. And that was uh, regarding um, composting toilets, worm farms, using worm farms as composting toilets, um, and um, how good are composting toilets and how good are worm farms? So there's a theme there that people are interested in um, using you know, using composting toilets, and then and or using worm-based ones? Because I know there's there's, a, there's you know, a, a number of different composting toilets around. Does anybody have any experience or, or knowledge of those? Perhaps I might start with Eric, um, just to see what, what you've got there, Eric, and then then uh, Margaret and Roman can jump in after that. Yeah, yeah, like, uh, yeah, thanks, Mark. Like, like, yeah, fair bit, actually. Um, at Earthcare, we have a uh, Clivus Multrum, which is like a, a sand, uses a sand filter as a secondary thing, but that's a wet composting system. So all the water from the whole building goes in there and then it, that water is separated, filtered out, and then that's pumped through a sand filter and then, and then that's pumped through another filter and that's put out below, you know, on the ground where it's dissipated. All the, and that's a lot of water that comes through that system. And, and indeed, that uses worms as well. I think you'll find once you start having a worm farm on your house, on your property, 
you'll find worms pop up everywhere. They'll just gravitate to to those those fertility places. And you know, I mean, I, I I've read lots about worms in terms of how they they turn a lot of toxic things into beautiful things too. So they're quite amazing in terms of their ability to you know not only detoxify but of course make make nutrient far more readily available to plants too in that system. So um, so that's a really important thing. At home here too, I've got a reed bed that, you know, where the water goes through, but I've got a Clovis Multrum, which is a dry composting system too. And again, the worms have gravitated there too. And you just need like uh, to manage like, like, like any compost system, you know, your carbon nitrogen and your a bulking agent so that you have, mm. so that the urine, sometimes the urine is best to separate as well too, because you can deal with that in a much more productive way than once it's mixed with excrement and then you have to try to like separate those things too. So, so there's a whole range of issues there too, but no, I think there's a bit of extra work, you know, and, um, mm. but the, the amount of water that you don't use, you know, I think Roman mentioned the, what 15%, but I reckon here it's almost 30% of, of the, of the water would go through a, through a regular, you know, system toilet system. So, uh, mm. I have, a, I have a slightly a slightly different way of treating it at home, at least for me. It's, it's called wee on a tree. So um, that's, you know, that's Great fine, fine. Yeah, yeah. So I, I find a different tree out in the backyard and just go out there. Well, not when people are there, obviously, but um, and it's and it's and it's a bit disconcerting if I can hear somebody in the backyard next door. But you know, um, but yeah, that that saves saves water when when you're going out because you're not flushing and it provides nutrients and that's where most of the nutrients are. Um, mm. in the urine anyway so um, yeah even if you do things like that and I know some people who do keep you know it's an uns- some people think it's an unsavory subject but keep it in buckets and then go out and, and do it I'm, I'm not quite there that yet but I'm quite happy to go down the backyard and it's a really and- it's a really powerful fertilizer though too and I think you'll find yeah. the organic certifying bodies won't you it won't allow you to use urine but I think if you mix it with like a high carbon material like like wood chips you know then yeah then it's a, it's a beautiful and if you're in the same oh. spot all the time it makes it makes a difference too but if you're going around okay. the only thing i have to do is i'm down in my orchard area is i have to kick the chooks away or otherwise they come up and really interested so that's a bit annoying as well so <laughs> the, the joys of sustainability yeah. isn't it um, so yeah, roman, this, roman and margaret have you got this, a comment on that yeah, yeah, yeah uh, all right there the, is there is uh, sorry okay go on roman first yeah, and margaret, the yeah. bucket uh, i'm actually making uh, the fertilizer in a way i'm using uh, wood ash and uh, pink in that bucket, then diluted it, and it's the best fertilizer for tomatoes and bananas, uh, whatever actually needs a lot of potassium, because in, um, in a wood ash is uh, about 10% of potassium, mm. and they love it. Uh, but you have to dilute it, otherwise you burn it. Uh, the citrus trees, they absolutely would love you to be around them. Mm. Um, on, in terms of uh, composting toilets, uh, as far as I know, I don't have experience with, uh, with the worms and, uh, and so on, but using human manure from the composting toilets, uh, you would be actually getting about 70% of your needs for garden fertilizer. So uh, you are closing the loop and you would need just a 30% top up of uh, from other sources to kind of keep you going and eating if you know what i mean mm-hmm. yeah Margaret? you have to be careful that you don't eat um, antibiotics dewormers and this sort of yes. stuff because you know medicine will end up um there are three types of composting toilets as far as i can think and i was interested in this issue um first is a composting toilet which uses uh, the air movement so actually um you get a buildup of dry matter uh, in your composting toilet and you, you, it builds into a small volcano shape. So you need to basically remove it and it's powdered already. So you can uh, use it uh, in compost. You can you know, mix it with water, with biochar and whatever. Then uh, there are wet uh, composting toilets when um, you mix some sort of uh, high carbon material. So I've seen coffee chaff being used and the very fine dried um, um, sawdust, but it has to be sawdust from pure wood, not from companies which make uh, furniture, kitchen furniture from MDF or plywood because of the glues. And uh, you also add uh, bacterial cultures to this. So such toilet does not smell and uh, you can basically shovel whatever is in there 
you have to have access under you know under the toilet mm -hmm. to get it and you can add it to compost or you can spread it into your garden as top mulch and then the third system it's the worm uh, toilet and a friend of mine who built a straw bale house they actually get all output from their home which is you know gray water laundry kitchen water and uh, and the toilet into a big buried in the ground worm farm and they've got uh, i think it's got two stages one it's sort of going through um through worms with uh, some wood chip and another is sort of the liquid stage i don't remember what it is but um you can get uh, something like that and uh, you can put it away from the house it's buried in the ground you just got you know a thing which is uh, basically a ration um, chimney and and that's it and speaking about watering garden trees i was just laughing because this is such a boy thing i just, <laughs> I just got a bucket in my garden next to the compost with some wood chips in it or coffee chaff and that's what i use when i'm in a garden and uh, in terms of the liquid output um, I don't collect humanure, but um, I am thinking about it. And if you use normal toilet at home, you can still reduce water usage. And you probably know the saying, if, it, if it's yellow, let it mellow. <laughs> if it's brown, flush it down. Exactly. So you yeah. don't have to flush yeah. every time. And it's been really interesting talking about composting toilets that um, at, at more and more of the events that I'm going to, um, they're bringing in composting toilets and bringing in uh, companies that actually do composting. And I was at, a, at the um, Off-Grid Living Festival earlier this year, and that whole event was managed and run um, sustainably, obviously, but they had the, a company that was, was actually profitable make, uh, providing composting toilets so they so all of the material that was was there in the toilets was being taken away to a composting station and and being and being turned into fertilizer for for non for non you know, for for um general use on on non edibles and things but so it's 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 coming along more and more i'm sure that we could actually have a complete um a, a, a four-hour seminar a webinar on this just on, on itself just yes, this topic as well and and people find and it's quite interesting because people find it both fascinating and a bit sort of icky icky sort of thing um which is which but it's it draws people in anyway and 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 there should be more it's of it cultural. I mean, it's cultural it's it cultural you just yeah. learn yeah. which things are icky and which are not exactly your parents right. yeah. when you are little yeah and mm -hmm. and as soon as you have kids you 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 very quickly get over it because you yeah. have to um it's, and i think yeah. i think the victoria the victorian era has a lot to answer to i think well yeah i actually wrote a blog on that a while ago and uh, not to sidetrack this discussion and um it was basically one of the big engineering achievements in the health services was back in the early 19th century when we did create um, a sewerage system, which was particularly important for large overpopulated cities of the day, which was London and you know, right through Europe and, and, and through the subcontinent and India and everything, where you did have outbreaks of cholera and disease and everything because of the poor sanitation systems. So getting that stuff under the ground and away from people and not having it sitting on the surface because it wasn't managed properly was a big deal. But it's come so far now that we now can't imagine bringing it back and actually starting to recycle it locally and so we've got to come we've got to sort of try and break away from that mindset and it's it's happening but it's just going to be a slow process i think yeah, um yeah. now we've got you about be, if, um, if yep, i could sorry. just continue um talking about commercial use of human urine um, as a child in okay about 40 years ago uh, in poland my parents used to my dad used to many sort of experimental government farms something like abare or csiro and I remember because we were, we were in a village, we were not on sewage system. We had septic tanks, everyone. They used to mm. bring this, you know, big uh, cistern with the pump. They would pump this, uh, our septic tanks and then they would spread it on the fields, usually in autumn before winter when the fields were fallow, they would um, till everything. They would uh, plant lucerne or something like that, you know, to add the... Uh, so, you know, it's not very long ago, it was still used in Europe. People would pump oh, yeah. tanks and put everything on fields mm -hmm. and it would decompose. It would go through winter. They would put green manure on it. And then, mm -hmm. and they also were doing crop rotation. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was amazing. Yeah. Now I realize what it was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and 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 still used in in many other parts of the parts of the world. And and the, and this is the issue with it is it's got to be done properly and in a safe way. And so, if you actually do it in a safe way, it's fine. It's when you let it 
build up in cities and it just becomes too much of a problem oh, to yes. deal with in that way that that's 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 what that's what the issue is just running along with that theme too um we've got about 10 minutes to go um and running along with that theme was a few people said in, that um what happens if you're constantly putting uh, water, perhaps grey water, but even just rainwater and stuff into a, a bog drain garden? Does it start becoming, um, do you start actually sort of adding contaminants to it because you've basically got a system where you've got water being used and then disappearing, but the metal, the you know, the, the um, materials that the water carried in are still there. So do you get a concentration of things like salts or heavy metals or um, pollution or anything um, coming off the water from the roof, for example, into those boggy areas where you've got a bog garden? So, Margaret, I think that's probably one for you. All right. Uh, you could do a few things. First, make sure that this water is pretty clean. So, for example, as I said, I only take uh, rainwater and store it from the part of my roof, which has got no lead flashing. So that's one thing. Um, there is hardly enough pollution on the roof to warrant uh, particular attention, unless you are living in heavy mining area or, you know, somewhere near chemical factories and stuff like that, which majority of people really don't. And uh, the last one is you can actually test your soil. There is a free testing system. Actually, I think they ask for $20 donation, which is at the Macquarie University. It's called Veggie Safe Program. And you can test up to five samples from your garden. Okay. So you can, and they test them for heavy metals, I think for about 30 heavy metals or something like that, some mm -hmm. huge amount. So if you are concerned about it, uh, you test it. Um, you may also choose if you, if you see that you know you get contaminants if the water in the water which goes to bog garden, then you don't plant edibles there. You just plant something that cleans water. And I've seen, I think it was on Gardening Australia. I've seen large commercial water cleaning. They were actually cleaning sewage using a system of ponds and reed beds. And that was on huge scale. Mm. So you definitely can use plants to clean the water. Well, Werribee and in Melbourne is in the west, western suburbs of Werribee. In Melbourne, there's a massive system like that in, in Werribee where we use the same they use the same thing. It's just, it's a big open open land area where they actually do that exact same treatment. And, yeah, that, that, uh, maybe, that, maybe that's the one which I've seen on Gardening Australia. I, I yeah. saw it somewhere. Yeah. Mm. And, and so, and related to that then is another question that came in. Um, do you think it's okay to directly um, irrigate your land, just having the water come straight from the downpipe with no storage or anything? So you're just basically diverting the water from the roof directly out onto the out onto the uh, garden. Is that a is that a, a, an easy thing to do or a good thing or are there special considerations that you should think? I might actually throw that um, first to um, to Roman and then maybe to Eric and then back to Margaret for that question. Yeah, uh, what I would say is again, you you have to use a common sense. So if you're draining um, uh, washing machine into the one spot all the time, obviously there will be buildup of, uh, of negative stuff. So you want to kind of spread it around. Uh, and if you do this, uh, then it should be fine because uh, the nature actually helps you to, to clean stuff. And uh, especially when you don't use ink like a nasty uh, detergents or anything like that mm -hmm. in the household, then it should, shouldn't be that, um, that of concern. And so what about... That. What about water coming off the roof, though? Instead of storing it in the rainwater tank or something, where you just divert it straight out into the onto your onto your garden or out into the out into the area around the house, is what sort of considerations uh, we need to take into account? Okay, so uh, what you would be adding is uh, the contaminants from the roof to the garden. So uh, it would be twice as much as uh, is as if it's falling on the garden anyway. Mm. Right. Exactly. <laughs> if you so, have contaminants uh, on the roof, yeah, the, the burden, yeah, Sorry. the burden wouldn't be that great. Right. Okay. So, what about uh, in terms of it, is do you have a problem with like, soil types, for example? Maybe um, throw back to Margaret for a start, and then we'll get Eric to, to finish this bit off. Um, with different soil types, you said you're on brick clay virtually, Margaret, and that you've had to um, get the soil in much better condition so it soaks up water. So how do you manage that water runoff? And how do you determine, uh, which is another question, the amount of water that you're getting 
um, in uh, coming from your roof or coming from just from a rain event and everything? How much? How do you determine what sort of water is is actually landing on your on your land, and then how much comes off your roof and on top of that? Well, uh, what comes from my roof gets stored in rainwater tanks, and I mostly use it at home. Mm. Uh, not as much in a garden, but uh, I don't really do much calculations because I just uh, get uh, the statistics from the Bureau of Meteorology from the mm -hmm. nearest weather station, which is about two kilometers from me, which is pretty good. Mm. So in, you know, in straight line. So for statistics, that's what I have. But uh, from uh, practice, I know that my garden can absorb any, any rainfall up to about 25 centimeters a day. Wow. That's yes. a lot of water. Because, because yeah. I've got a lot of mulch, I've yeah. got swales, I've got, uh, you know, plant cover, I've got the methods to slow the water mm. runoff, so it actually so soaks into the soil. That's, um, that's that much water over all that, your land. Yeah. yeah. So I only get runoff after sort of after the first 25 centimeters. Wow, that's and a I lot, can yeah. see that the garden cannot absorb it because I've got steep garden, which has got swales, mulch and plants. Mm -hmm. Then I've got some footpath, which is straight and I'm going to put little gutters in uh, across uh, the footpath, which will direct water into swales as well. That will slow the water too, going down the path. Then I have pretty flat area, which is lawn. And I've got a big sort of drainage pipe there because if it rains really heavily and I'm over 25 centimeters, then this lawn, as I see it being converted into a pond, the excess water has to run off somewhere. So it mm. ends in pipes, but um, I was talking centimeters, not millimeters, John. Yeah, 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 that's, yeah. Centimeters. that's, 200, that's 250 millimeters, which is and just an amazing amount of water. Yeah, yeah but yeah. most of this water stays in a garden. And yeah. that's because the garden uh, hasn't really, it's got only one straight path downhill. Otherwise, everything is horizontal. So very much uh, the layout of the garden looks like a leaf. So it's got the main path and then it's got paths coming out of it, like veins in a leaf, which also yeah. stops water added to this. Are the so, it spreads, so it spreads out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it stops the water because the paths and the swales are across the slope. And Eric, uh, what about you? Have you got have you got any thoughts about diverting rainwater directly out onto the garden, or are you more of a fan of, of, of keeping the tank and using it when it's needed? No, no. I think you know. I think Margaret mentioned this too before too. That the best place to, to keep water is in the soil mm. for lots of reasons, and mm. and indeed, I think it's one of the greatest things that we overlook, you know, in Australia considerably. You know, because Peter Andrews talks about that too. And in fact, he's not averse to use to dropping a log and putting, allowing weeds to proliferate as long as you're collecting water, you know. So that anything that slows water down mm -hmm. and, and you'll find, but you've got to do your homework a bit too and calculate, you know, like what's the catchment for this area and, and indeed what's what, you know, what infiltration capacity have I got? Mm. But of course, the old swales thing, you know, and indeed key line, I think too, you know, running swales just off the contour so that things so the water moves but it moves very very slowly and it and all the sediment drops out you get nutrient with it and as time goes by root systems get deeper i mean we could really build phenomenal amounts of soil by mm -hmm. just increasing infiltration too and i'm trying to convince the rural fire service too they show how we should manage those zones between wildfires and the built-up areas those areas which should become saturation zones where yeah. you divert water and saturate those areas and that'll lower the temperature and decrease the fire hazard too so but i will say too that the other thing i think you need to be careful of is sodium sodium is an element that i think you need to be a little bit careful of too and it's because in a lot of the things that we you know in your food products that we buy they are very high in sodium and so we ex our bodies excrete therefore a lot of sodium and so that's another issue that you need to keep where, but if you just keep rotating it around too, I knew people that just had a hose and they just leave it there for a few weeks and then move it yep. on a few weeks. Yep. And I will here put in a big plug for biodiversity too. The more living things you can have in a given space, the more capacity there is to capture nutrients, water, pollutants, and all those sorts of things too. I think that's a really. I was gonna. I was just about to ask everybody if they wanted to make one comment that that would you know sort of wrap the whole thing up, and um, 
I think that was a perfect one from you, Eric, already. So well done for preempting me. Um, <laughs> that whole thing about biodiversity. And I did watch um, David Attenborough program the other night, which was um, Breaking Boundaries. And there was a big thing of, about water in there and about biodiversity and how everything's linked to everything else. And so um, mm. one comment that I would make is that one of the other questions that I've seen quite often in other forums is um, people complaining that their soil isn't holding water right? or isn't or is, or is, is a hydrophobic hydrophobic soil. yeah hydrophobic soils not realizing so it rained heaps last night and, and and the soil's only wet this deep um you may not have a problem and so when you point out to people that yes that rain yesterday i looked it up on the bureau and there was like five millimeters fell well that means you're only going to get five millimeters penetration of the water anyway because that's all that fell there was only mm. five millimetres of water. So you have to get large rain events to actually get that water to infiltrate. Once it goes down there, it stays there and, and holds it. So um, start doing a little bit of background and, and saying, make sure that what you're doing is treating the condition that you think is there. So if it's if you think your soil is hydrophobic, then one way to do it is to actually test it with, with a hose, with a watering bucket and everything to mm. see if it's, it is really, or if it's just that, that rain you thought was a lot isn't, necessarily that much so um, so eric i've got that was a great thing for way to finish on that one margaret i'll get you to uh finish uh make just make one general comment if you wanted to people to take away anything at all on this presentation what would it be and then i'll get roman to do the same think about what you eat because the biggest savings in our water and energy usage is the food we eat so grow your food even if it's just herbs in pots and picking greens because they are also very expensive per weight when you buy them from supermarket and they often get wasted and uh, visit the sustainable table website which also gives you some examples so go vegetarian three times a week four times a week the less meat the less water usage so the right. diet affects yep. our real water usage excellent and roman yeah what i would say is use common sense mm -hmm. yeah. mm. and don't uh, common sense don't... Is common though yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that people are losing permaculture right? common sense. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, don't wait and start something. Uh, because unless you live it, you don't know what is it like uh, to, to, to really live it. It's such an enjoyable yeah. time and lifestyle and, and so on. And be, be prepared to make mistakes. People yeah, are often exactly. very worried about trying something. Oh, what if I get it wrong? Well, then you learn from it. You'll do it right the next You're time. Learning. So, All the so time. yeah, so that's, that's, one of the big things so be prepared to make mistakes live your life now um watch what you eat right pay close attention to that because that has the biggest impact on water usage generally and biodiversity make sure you do everything you can to increase the biodiversity in your local area and beyond which is a really good permaculture principle as well um look thank you very much for all the present presenters uh, dennis really just dis disappointing we couldn't get you um on board because of the technical difficulties um, but i'm sure we'll we'll um have another opportunity to to hear that um, so Margaret, uh, Roman, uh, Eric, thank you very, very much for your time to, this evening. It was, it was brilliant. It was, I, I, I learned a, a lot of stuff. I'm sure everybody else learned mm. a lot of stuff. Um, right. we're getting comments coming in, uh, great presentations to all of you and you all did fabulous work. Um, there are a lot of questions that came in on the Q and A that we tried to blend together that we must have, that we would have missed out a little bit. Um, we apologize for those. So if there was a question that you didn't quite get the answer to, um, I'm sure we can actually um, do something about that later on. I'm sure Sophie and the rest of the team are, are right on that. And the, um, the, the key takeaway from this is, yeah, is, is water's really important. There are really good things we can do with water. They're not that difficult. Um, so, and, and keep, keep learning. So thank you again for everybody. Thank you for everybody for coming in on the webinar. It was great to see all the questions coming in. Uh, I had a great time. I hope everyone else had a great time, learned a lot of stuff. Um, and then, and, and thanks to the, to the team in the background and Sophie and, and all the rest of the, the crew. Um, well done guys. Um, take it away. We'll wrap it up there and we'll let Sophie. Um, I think it was wonderful. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you so much to everyone. Um, it was a really amazing presentation tonight. We really had a great time and we hope everyone enjoyed it. I just wanted to let you know before you go, uh, we have one more expert session this week uh, on heating and cooling on Thursday, and then we have our full day of free sessions 
that's coming up this Sunday on 17th October, which is Sustainable House Day. So you can go to our website, sustainablehouseday.com to see everything that's coming up and to register. And before I go, I just want to uh, thank our sponsors and our council partners for helping to make this event possible. So thanks so much to everyone. And I hope you have a great evening.